Great to be with you this morning. And I am so excited about what we have to share together uh, from the book of Acts. Uh, always one of my favorite books. Uh, let's just uh, briefly join in prayer for the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you send down your spirit to anoint uh, he who speaks and those who listen, that the word may go into our heart and bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, the book of Acts has always been a favorite of mine, and just to speak from my own experience uh, as a uh, Protestant pastor in my 20s, um, really as an urban missionary in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, I would often preach from the book of Acts as well as read it devotionally. And I, I did it with a, uh, a bittersweet sensation, uh, sweet because I loved the stories of the growth of the church and the, uh, the gospel fervor of the apostles and the other holy persons in the book of Acts, but bitter because I had a sense of loss. Uh, for example, as a Dutch Calvinist pastor, I would often um, evangelize even door to door and sometimes uh, lead people uh, to pray to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, a wonderful thing. Um, a kind of a, a turning point for, in some people's lives, certainly a, a big step in their spiritual life. But in my theology, that prayer to receive Jesus made them a Christian. And, uh, but then I was left with the awkward uh, task of explaining, what, now that you have become a Christian, you also need to join my Dutch Calvinist church. See? Um, and, and getting from, you know, Christian to Dutch Calvinist was, was always a, a bit of a struggle. And I had to make the case because once they were a Christian, they had a lot of options. There were six other churches in the neighborhood. There was a charismatic church, a Pentecostal church, an American Baptist church, a different brand of Dutch Calvinism church, um, some house churches uh, in what we used to call the projects, etc., so there were all these options, and I had to explain why my little version was the right one. But when I read in the book of Acts, what I noticed was becoming a Christian and becoming part of the church were just the same thing. And the apostles didn't have to explain why, oh, you need to join uh, First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, okay, um, and James wasn't arguing for, you know, uh, Presbyterian fire baptized church, you know, down the road. And, and John wasn't arguing for Mount Moriah Zion Church over uh, on uh, his part of Jerusalem. No, there was just one church, okay? Didn't have all this denominationalism, Episcopalianism, Lutheranism, etc. So I noticed in the book of Acts, when they became Christians, they just joined the church. And there wasn't any of this awkward explaining of why you have to be part of this group. And uh, so I longed, I longed for the simplicity of the book of Acts where there was just one church. But I thought to myself, you know what? That one church that Jesus founded uh, is no longer in existence. And now we just have 46,000 different denominations. And so I had this sense of loss. That one church has been lost. And I also noticed something else. Every, every, uh, my denomination, as well as all the other denominations uh, in the neighborhood, we all had different ways of governing the church. That's called church polity. Okay? In fact, I had a course in church polity in seminary, a, a course in church government. And I remember my professor in that course at one time remarking that uh, it's odd that the New Testament tells us so little about how to govern the church. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> the New Testament kind of makes it clear, but what it makes clear, we weren't willing to see. So it's kind of like, it doesn't say anything. <laughs> we look and look. 
Yeah, we can't see anything there. Okay. Yeah, because the, the elephant in the room is that it was guided by the apostles and then, then those appointed by the apostles, what we call apostolic succession. But since we were blind to that, we're like, whoa, why is it that it doesn't tell us anything? So I longed for that original oneness of the church, and I longed for the, the simple structure of the church led by the apostles and those appointed by them. But I had this sense of loss because I thought this was no longer available to us. We are out of touch. The unity, the succession had all been irreparably broken and now we were dealing with the, the mess that we had in the modern, modern period. Well, imagine my joy years later uh, to discover through the reading of the church fathers that the church that Jesus founded on the apostles still exists. It's still around. And that the succession from, of presbyters, from the apostles to those they appointed, to those appointed by their appointees, etc., down to the present time, has not been broken. It's still around. And this is the Catholic Church. This is the universal church. And in many ways, we are still living in the book of Acts, okay? The Catholic Church inhabits the book of Acts because all the dynamics that we see going on in the church in Acts both the good as well as the trouble. I mean, there's friction in the book of Acts, okay? Sometimes the apostles and the apostolic men, okay, have falling outs, right? Peter and Paul, well, not in, not in Acts, but in Galatians, we see Peter and Paul having a falling out, okay? Uh, we see uh, Barnabas and Paul in Acts having disagreements, right? Do we ever have bishops having disagreements with one another? Ah, oh, that would never happen, okay? But then we sometimes see that, don't we? Sometimes we see even cardinals having disagreements with one another. We say, oh, 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 the church is falling apart. No, 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 okay? Church is not falling apart, okay? Paul and Barnabas had disagreements, okay? Bishops and cardinals and popes will have disagreements, okay? It does not mean that the church is falling apart, Okay? Uh, this has been true since the beginning. God uh, writes straight uh, with, uh, with crooked vessels, okay, with crooked instruments. Um, we are perpetually the saints and the sinners that we see in the book of Acts. But through it all, this is the point, through it all, God is building his kingdom. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So let's take a look at this. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be going over Acts uh, 1 and 2 this morning. Uh, oftentimes it's said that the theme of Acts is the church, but as uh, Dr. Hahn pointed out last night, really the theme is the kingdom. As Dr. Hahn showed in, in 1.3, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom for 40 days. At the, at the end of Acts, Paul is teaching about the kingdom. That is an intentional, what we call a literary inclusio, or a bookend at, at the front and the back. Uh, so that tells us what the theme of this document is. This is about the growth of the kingdom. It's about the church as well, but the whole key to Acts is understanding that the church is the manifestation of the kingdom. It's the visible face of the kingdom on earth. And so we read in the beginning of Acts, in the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his passion for many uh, days, uh, through many proofs, excuse me, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them of the kingdom of God. We just remarked on that. And while staying with them, and that's a bad translation, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, etc., the Holy Spirit. Uh, while staying with them in verse 4, no, it's not, that's not the word. Um, as Dr. Hahn mentioned this as well, the word is actually sunalizamonos, uh, excuse me, sunalizamonos, uh, which means literally to take salt with, and it's expression for sharing a meal, because in ancient times, every meal was served with some salt in a little bowl, you dip your fingers in the salt, sprinkle the salt on your food to give it savor, and then you would eat, so taking salt with someone was eating with someone, so... Um, 
if you're reading as I am in the RSV, you look down in the textual note in verse 4, it says, and while staying, and then it's got a little superscript A there, and you go down to the bottom, and it says A, or eating, okay, staying or eating. Okay. Well, if it's eating, Mr. Bible Translators, uh, why didn't you put eating up in the text? Okay. <laughs> So I did a little research on this. I searched, you know, uh, Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, uh, Donker, the, this, it's called Bag D, this big, big Greek lexicon of the New Testament. I look up sunalizomenos. I'm like, why do they translate it eating here? And, you know, it says taking salt with an idiom for eating. Except in Acts 1-4. Does it make sense in context? Yeah. That would make no sense. No sense whatever for Jesus to share a meal with the apostles after he rose from the dead. Like, that wouldn't have any theological significance to it. Right. Okay. All right. So, stay. Staying with them. No! It's eating with them. And that has huge theological importance. Because in 22, 15 through 18 in, in Luke, okay... In, in the, uh, I, won't, I don't read it all, but in the Last uh, Supper account in Luke, or the institution of the Eucharist in Luke, Jesus talks about not eating or drinking again with the apostles until he does so in the kingdom of God. So now that he's eating with the apostles, what does that indicate? That the kingdom of God, in, in some mysterious sense, in more than a mysterious sense, in some concrete senses, actually, all right, has, has come to rest uh, on, on the earth, and in particular, on the shoulders of the apostles. So this has huge significance that he's sharing a meal. It attests to the reality of his resurrection. It is a fulfillment of his promise that he would eat and drink with, uh, with the apostles in the kingdom. Let's, uh, let's go forward, in fact, to Acts 10, 42. Excuse me, 41. Um, and just take note of this. Um, if you turn with me to Acts 10, 41, Peter will later refer to this habit of Jesus of eating with the apostles... And I have to back up a little bit to get to the beginning of the sentence, which is actually in the middle of verse 39. Peter says, They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Now verse 40, But God raised him on the third day and made him manifest, not to all the people, but to those who were chosen by God as witnesses, martyria. And that's probably referring back to uh, Acts 1, where Jesus says, You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Okay, the apostles, God as martyr or witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Okay, so explicit attestation of the eating and drinking of Jesus, indicating that the kingdom had uh, arrived. And um, so as they continue to discuss with our Lord in these 40 days, and especially as the ascension approaches, as we move back to Acts 1, they ask, they ask specifically about the timing of the complete restoration of the kingdom. So in verse 1, 6, we read, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, they're, simply, they're not simply asking about the restoration of the kingdom. Already at, um, already at the Last Supper in Luke 22, uh, round about verse 30, Jesus tells them, I covenant to you, as my Father covenanted to me, a kingdom, right? uh, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, this is, uh, again, Luke 22, uh, round about verse 30. And that's very important. Everything that Jesus says there about covenanting, covenanting to them a kingdom, you won't read covenant in your English translations. It usually says, uh, I... I give to you, or I, um, oh, I can't remember the, the uh, uh, exact phrase that the RSV uses, um, but uh, you'll, you'll read various translations, mean I transfer to you, or I bestow on you, something like that. But the actual Greek word is diatithemi, or to covenant uh, to someone. 
And uh, translators don't know what to do with that. What would it mean to covenant a kingdom to someone? But what, what's being missed here is the Old Testament background because there was a kingdom in the Old Testament that was granted by virtue of a covenant. And it was the kingdom of David. And that's, of course, hugely significant because Luke 1 and 2 are all about Jesus being the son of David, right? Right? So think about the Annunciation. What does the angel Gabriel say to the Blessed Mother in, uh, in Luke 1? Okay. Um, well, let's take a look. And um, the actual terms of the Annunciation are this. I'll read Luke 1, 32 and 33. Speaking of Jesus, Gabriel says, He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now virtually everything that Gabriel says in those two verses uh, can be found also in 2 Samuel 7, which, as many of you know, is the famous chapter in the Old Testament where God grants a covenant of kingship to David. And so the the Annunciation, this mystery that we meditate on regularly as we pray uh, the the rosary, is actually based on the ancient royal covenant given to David. Now, when I was a kid, I used to read all that, you know, the, the opening chapters of Luke and the opening chapters of Matthew were all this royal David stuff, right? Okay? Born in David's city, okay? Bethlehem, you got the royal gifts being brought by the Magi, you have two genealogies in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, tracing Jesus back to David, you have the Annunciation of Gabriel, he's going to be sit on the throne of David, and I would read that as a kid, and then I would get into the rest of the gospel, and I thought that all disappeared. You know, I'm like, well, how on earth do you connect all this royal David stuff with the rest of the gospel and then with the book of Acts, okay? I thought to myself, well, it's not fulfilled, right? What Gabriel says isn't fulfilled because Jesus doesn't end up sitting on a throne. He ends up hanging on a cross, okay? And he doesn't end up reigning over the kingdom of Israel. He ends up founding the church, you know? So, uh, so it's kind of like, you know, God promised us the kingdom, but all we got was this lousy church, you know? <laughs> Which is what the famous uh, apostate Alfred Wazee uh, said the, in the 19th uh, century, basically, you know? Uh, so, so you read the gospel, you're like, disappointment, right? I thought he was going to reign on the throne, and I thought he was going to reign over the kingdom. But as a kid, I was missing it. The cross is the throne. Okay? He reigns from the cross. And the church is the kingdom. And what Jesus promised is fulfilled. That's the whole point of Matthew 13. Remember those parables about the kingdom? Okay? The parables about the kingdom say what? It's going to be like a mustard seed. Right? Goes to the ground. Mustard seed is contemptible and small. Ha, 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 that lowly mustard seed. I don't need to pay attention to that mustard seed. It's so small. Okay. But it grows up to become this great bush, right? Like leaven in a dough that you can't see, but then it has this huge effect, right? Like treasure buried in a field, okay? These are all parables about the kingdom, right? What is it telling us? It's telling us that the kingdom isn't going to be obvious to everyone, Right? And people are going to rush right past, uh, drive by on the highway and not realize that there's treasure buried in that field over there because there's no billboard that says, treasure, exit, one mile, buried treasured field here, rent a spade, five bucks. You You don't get that. And so people driving by on the highway of life, they're going to miss it. It's only those who are looking uh, who are going to find it, and then only by the grace of God, okay? But we, it's as if we don't read Matthew 13, as if we don't digest that, because we still, you know, we still read these, 
these, the Annunciation, we read those words and think, oh gosh, you know, uh, that didn't really happen. He didn't really sit on the throne of David. He's not ruling over the kingdom of, of David forever. Uh, maybe that's some kind of heavenly reality or something like that. Okay? We miss it. But we have to put it all together. Okay? And then we realize, yes, you've got to look with the eyes of faith. Okay? If you look with the eyes of faith, you realize Jesus is, as I said, reigning from the cross. The church mocked contemptible, broken, bleeding, uh, marginalized by the world, is actually the kingdom of God and is actually what is giving life to the world. It is actually what is leavening human society. It's actually what is providing food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Okay? Everyone feeds off the church even as they kick it and cast it to the side. Human culture feeds off the church. Modern civilization feeds off the church, even while it despises her. But nonetheless, the church is the kingdom of God in the world. So, so discovering the connection between the church and the kingdom, uh, as we see it in Acts and elsewhere, was a big revelation for me, enabling me to connect all the royal descriptions at the beginning of the Gospels to Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of heaven during his earthly ministry, to the growth of the kingdom of heaven on earth that we see in the book of Acts. And that's, that's the point right here. And so let's get back to it in uh, Acts 1. The apostles asked, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus, of course, answers, it's not for you to know times or seasons, but you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria and the ends of the earth. Now, it's often interpreted that, uh, that Jesus is rebuffing the apostles. They ask about the kingdom, and he says, don't worry about the kingdom, just worry about growing the church. But I would suggest to you that what's really going on here is that the apostles are asking when, but Jesus answers with how. When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, Lord? Well, don't worry about the times and the seasons which the Father's appointed. But this is how it's going to happen. You're going to be my martyria. You're going to be my witnesses. (laughs) In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that sequence, um, as others have pointed out, is extremely significant. And here we're going to fill in that bullseye uh, target that you've got there on page one. Because this... This sequence that Jesus mentions is very theologically significant. He says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was, of course, David's capital. It was like the federal district of David, okay? Uh, it, was, it did not belong to any tribe. It was a royal fief. It was a royal territory, kind of a federal, a federal district. Didn't belong to Judah. Didn't belong to, Beth, uh, to uh, Benjamin. Um, it was the city of David. So Jerusalem was David's capital. That was the heart of David's kingdom. So Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Then you're going to be my witnesses in Judea. Now Judea what, what was the remnants of the tribe of Judah, the territorial land of Judah. And Judah, of course, was David's tribe. For the first seven years of of David's kingship, he was king over Judah and not yet over all of Israel. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, David's tribe. And then you're going to be my witnesses in Samaria. Now, Samaria was all that was left of the ten northern tribes, the tribes of Israel, that came under David's authority as king after he had ruled in Hebron over over Judah for seven years. The other ten tribes came to him in 2 Samuel 5 and uh, made him king over also the ten tribes. So, we'll put here the ten tribes of Israel. These were David's nation. 
not his own tribe, but they were his nation. And then finally, Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Now, the ends of the earth is an idiom. It's an expression from the Psalms that refers to the Gentiles, the nations. And the Gentiles were promised by God to David as his vassals. If you read the great passages of the Davidic covenant in uh, Psalm 2, Psalm 89, 2 Samuel 7, you'll see that it's not simply over Israel that God granted David rulership. God really promised him rulership over the whole earth. Okay? And all the nations were supposed to come to know David as uh, their king, or at least the heir of David, the son of David, as their king. So... This sequence, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, this is very theologically significant. On one, on one hand, it is the structure of the book of Acts, because the first seven chapters are going to be spent in Jerusalem. Then there's a persecution that breaks out and causes the church to spread to Judea and Samaria. And then starting in chapter 9 to the end of the book, we have the gospel going out to the ends of the earth to all the Gentiles. So... This is the structure of the book of Acts. It's also a theological map of the kingdom of David. This Jesus is the son of David. His kingdom is not only the kingdom of God, it's also the kingdom of David. Just as he is fully God, fully man, fully the son of God, fully the son of David, the kingdom that Jesus established is fully the kingdom of God and also fully the kingdom of David. So this is the expansion. This is the building of the kingdom. And it's been ongoing since, uh, since uh, Pentecost, and it continues to this day. So let's move on now from the ascension to the replacement of Judas, where we also get royal themes. I'll just read a little bit here in, from Acts 1, 12 through 26. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. They went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. So Peter stands up among the brethren and says, look, we've got to replace Judas, who was numbered among us and had a share in the ministry, get a little explanation of his death. And then St. Peter quotes from the Psalms. Let his habitation become desolate, and his office let another take. So they uh, put forward two men. They cast lots, and uh, the uh, lot falls to Matthias, who is enrolled in the place of Judas. Now, this is very significant. First of all, there's a sort of sacramental significance of there being 12 apostles, and they're down to 11, and they need to bring their numbers back up to 12. Uh, what, is, what is the significance here? It's... It's a, it's a sacred symbolism that goes back to several things in the Old Testament. Of course, we think of the 12 patriarchs of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel. But then in a particular way, we think of 1 Kings uh, 4, uh, verses 7 through 19. That's a typo there. It's not verse 87, but verse 7 there, verse 7 through 19, where uh, Solomon appointed 12 officers over the kingdom of Israel at the height of his reign. And of course, Solomon is a type or an image of Jesus. We see that in many uh, places in the, in the Gospels. And so likewise, following this Solomonic pattern, our Lord also has appointed 12 officers over his kingdom. That was the point of Luke twenty two thirty. I covenant to you a kingdom as my father covenanted one to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and that you may rule that you may sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This harkens back to first Kings four seven, where Solomon established these viceroys or these princes who sat on thrones judging the twelve tribes uh, on his behalf. 
So you need, they need to bring their numbers back up to 12. They need the 12 officers over the kingdom under the son of David. And then uh, St. Peter quotes this interesting passage from the Psalms, um, uh, Psalm uh, 109, verse 8. Uh, His office let another take. And as Dr. Hahn mentioned uh, last night, in Greek, this is literally his episcopane. Okay? Uh, the King James translated this as his bishopric. Okay? His episcopacy. It is a, uh, a Greek word which translates the Hebrew word pekuda, which means an appointed supervisor or an office to which one is appointed. And if you look through the Old Testament at, at all the instances of this word pekuda, the interesting thing is it's almost always within the context of the sanctuary and the priesthood. So those who hold a pekuda are almost always either the watchmen who guard the sanctuary, or the priests and the Levites themselves. So it's a priestly uh, office, and that goes along also with the uh, casting of lots, which Dr. Barber will talk about uh, in in his uh, session uh, later this afternoon, and the priestly background behind that, and the apostles holding this, uh, this role that is analogous to the priesthood in the Old Covenant. But let's, uh, let's do a little background on how we get the words for bishop and priest that we use in English today. Um, St. Peter says that, uh, that Judas held an episcopane, uh, the off- an office of oversight. Now, one who holds an episcopane in Greek is an episkopos, okay? And we recognize that. That's where we get the, the adjective episcopal from. Epi means over or super, and skopos means uh, seer. Uh, So you could translate it literally as overseer, or in Latin, a supervisor, right? Visor is from vision to see, and super means over, right? So episkopos is the same thing as a Latin supervisor. Uh, But then when the missionaries went out to uh, Germany and other... uh, uh, barbaric uh, peoples. Uh, I can say that honestly, being of partly German ancestry. Uh, and they said, we're going to give you an Episcopos. And uh, there's the Germans in their bearskins and their clubs. Episcopos. Biskoff. Biskoff. Okay, so you got the German Bischoff. Okay. And then German missionaries went to another half-educated barbarian people, the English. (laughs) Or even worse. And the English were like, Biscoff? Bishop. Bishop. Okay? That's the best they could do. So, So from Episcopos, we got bishop in English because our ancestors couldn't pronounce Greek. And then presbyteros in Greek, well, you know, <laughs> you can't expect English people to say a word as long as presbyteros. <laughs> so that gets shortened down to presbyter, and then priester, and then finally priest, okay? So these words get contracted, but these are, these are the Greek words that literally are the etymological root of our English word bishop and priest. So... This replacement of Judas by Matthias is extremely significant for uh, the principle of how the church is governed. It's illustrating for us the idea of what we call apostolic succession, that after the death of an apostle, you appoint someone to fulfill his role, his office. It's not simply a personal charism that the apostles had. That's how I believed as a Protestant. They They were enriched with certain gifts which were extinguished at their deaths. No, it's not just that, but they have an office. They have a role that, uh, that continues to need to be filled in the life of the church. And so um, <clears throat> the, uh, they had a role of supervision, episcopacy that continued after their death. And we see this pattern of apostolic succession uh, in the Gospels and in Acts. So let's just go through it point by point because this is a big difference between us as Catholics Uh, together with the Orthodox, who agree with us on this issue of apostolic succession, 
and the other Christian groups that are out there. The other Christian groups that are out there, like those that I belong to, believe that, ah, you know, the apostles died, that was it, and then we moved to democracy, <laughs> okay? Because right. that's clear in Scripture, right? It says that. Oh, yeah, I think it's in Second Hezekians. Uh, <laughs> after the apostles died, just hold a vote. Yeah, there it is, Second Hezekians 2.13. Okay, but that's not actually the pattern that we see in the Bible. What is the pattern for church governance that we see in the Bible? Well, first of all, Jesus appoints the apostles, right? Luke 6, 12 through 16. He chose 12, named apostles, fulfilling a pattern that we saw in 1 Kings 4, 7. 12 officers over the kingdom appointed by the son of David. And then what do the apostles do? Well, the apostles appoint presbyteroi. Okay, literally elders, but it wasn't really about age because, for example, Timothy was appointed as a presbyteros even though he was a young man. And uh, St. Paul writes to him and says, don't let anybody dis disdain you because of your youth. Okay, so we see from that that you didn't have to be literally old to be a presbyteros, to be an elder. Okay, it was, uh, it was a, a statement of spiritual maturity and not simply... Uh, a statement of, uh, of physical age, all right? So the apostles appointed presbyteroi, from which we get the term priests, Acts 14, 23, when they had appointed presbyteroi for them in every church, okay? So the apostles didn't leave the church without elders. They didn't say, see you later. Taking the next boat to Corinth. Have a vote once we leave, okay? No, they didn't do that. Before they leave, they make provision for the governance of the church, and they appoint, okay, they appoint presbyteroi uh, because this is a monarchy, okay? It's not, it's not the, the, the people's republic of Jesus, okay? Uh, it is the kingdom of David. It's the kingdom of the son of David, okay? So we appoint, they appointed presbyteroi in every church, and then these presbyteroi appointed yet others because... In Titus 1.5, Titus is a presbyteros that Paul has appointed, uh, not just a presbyteros, but an episkopos as well. Later we would say bishop. And Paul writes to Titus and says, this is why I left you on Crete, that you might appoint presbyteroi in every town. So the apostles in Acts appoint the presbyteroi, but then later as the church gets bigger and bigger, and the apostles get older and older. Now, some of the men that the apostles appointed, in this case Titus, themselves appoint other leaders. So we're seeing this pattern of apostolic succession. And then someone might say, well, yeah, but you know, those that the apostles appoint don't have the authority of the apostles. Um, but that's not exactly what we see in Acts. The, what we see in Acts is that the apostles already, and this is very important, they already begin to share with the presbyteroi uh, their authority to govern the church while they are still alive, while the apostles are still alive. So in Acts 15, when they gather together as uh, the first church council in Jerusalem, if you will, to consider whether or not they should require the Gentiles to be circumcised, it's the apostles in the presbyteroi who gather to consider this. And then they make a decision together, and, and Luke says that as they went on their way, they delivered uh, to them, this is the messengers of the council, delivered to the church for observance the decisions which have been reached by the apostles and the presbyteroi, okay? The apostles and the elders. So it wasn't simply the decision of the apostles, it was the decision of the apostles and the elders, because the apostles are cognizant that they're going to they're gonna move on. They're going to go to the Lord someday. They're going to be martyred. They're going to die, etc. People have to be ready to govern the church. And so, as good leaders, they, uh, they provide for their own succession. Okay? A bad, you can tell a bad leader because when a bad leader dies, his organization collapses. Okay? That is a leader who didn't realize the position. The, uh, the importance of discipleship, okay? That while you are yet alive, you need to raise up disciples to take your place, okay? 
The church did not collapse on the ascension of our Lord because our Lord had spent his whole ministry preparing the twelve to carry on on earth. And a good priest, a good bishop uh, to this day is always raising up vocations to replace himself in his ministry as he moves on. And every one of us, for that matter, whatever our vocation is, we should always be looking for those to replace us, whether we're teachers Uh, Whether we're businessmen, whether we're homemakers, we should always be looking for the next generation. Who am I raising up to take on my role within church and within the society? That's the principle of discipleship. So they were giving them on-the-job training. They were allowing them to exercise authority while they were yet alive. First Peter remarks on this in his uh, first epistle. Excuse me, Peter remarks on this in his first epistle. He says, so I exhort, exhort the presbyteroi among you, As a fellow presbyteros and a martyr of the sufferings of Christ, tend the flock of God that is your episcopacy. Okay, here I'm translating quite literally from the Greek. Okay, so we see how in the early church, presbyteros and episkopos were kind of fluid terms. They they kind of overlapped with one another. But that Peter, the head of the apostles, regarded himself as the first generation of presbyteroi. Okay, he, was, he was a first-generation priest, and now he's talking to these other priests, and he's saying, you share the priesthood that I share, the presbyteros, the presbytere that I share. Okay? And he says, tend the flock of God in your midst, and that recalls to mind what Jesus said to Peter at the end of John. You know, uh, tend my sheep, keep my little lambs, etc., the threefold commission of, Jesus, of Peter as pastor, as shepherd at the end of John. And every presbyteros is in the image of Peter, if you will, a shepherd appointed by Jesus over a little flock. So, uh, so we see this succession of Peter to the presbyteroi that follow. And so Clement of Rome, uh, writing within the lifetime of the Apostle John, writes this. He says, Our apostles likewise knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife over the bishop's office. For this reason, therefore, having received complete foreknowledge, They appointed the officials mentioned earlier, and afterwards they gave the offices a permanent character, that is, if they should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. This is one of our earliest church documents after the New Testament. This is the the Apostolic Fathers. And I can remember reading this for the first time while I was still a Protestant at the University of Notre Dame in my little basement apartment at the University Village uh, on that uh, campus of that university uh, while I was... uh, pondering whether to become Catholic or not, and uh, I can remember uh, a cold fist of fear sinking into my gut as I read over what Clement read here and realized, oh, he's talking about apostolic succession. Guess that wasn't made up in the Middle Ages. Maybe that was quite early. And then St. Augustine, writing much later than St. Clement, writes, There are many other things which most properly can keep me in the Catholic Church's bosom. The succession of priests, the succession of presbyteroi, from the very seat of the Apostle Peter, right? We saw that in 1 Peter 5, to whom the Lord, after his resurrection, gave the charge of feeding his sheep. See that that, uh, that theme of of, uh, being the shepherd, okay? Up to the present episcopate. You see how episkopos and presbyteros are being kind of fluidly used here? Okay. Keeps me here, St. Augustine says. In time, we began to distinguish the terms. You know, there was a, a little bit, of, there was overlap between the terms presbyteros and episkopos in the early church, but in time, we began to designate the head presbyteros in a metropolitan area as the episkopos, and then the rest of the presbyteroi were just. Presbyteroi, okay? So he began to reserve the term episkopos for the chief presbyteroi, presbyteros in, uh, in the area uh, governed by a city. And that gives the origin of the way that we use the terms in the church uh, to this day. So this is all about uh, the replacement of Judas and about how the church is to be governed. And so once again, you know, when I was a, a Protestant, I, <laughs> I can't see it, okay? Can't figure out what the Bible says about how the church should be run. Okay, it's really right there in front of our faces. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. All right, let's move on to Pentecost. Pentecost uh, is related in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues of fire distributed and resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At the sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were amazed, wondered, are these not all Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So there were uh, Gentile converts present here as well. Cretans and Arabians who hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mock, saying they're filled with new wine. So this is Pentecost. Pentecost, interestingly, is the one feast still observed by both Jews and Christians. It's on both of our liturgical calendars. What is the significance of the Feast of Pentecost? Okay, In the Jewish calendar, which long predates this event in Acts 2, Pentecost marked the end of the grain harvest, okay, with the, with the bringing in of the wheat. So it was like a Thanksgiving festival. Part of Pentecost, in part, had the air of, uh, you know, November 25th, our feast of Thanksgiving at the end of the harvest where everything is gathered in. So it had that dynamic to it. But it also commemorated the event at Sinai, the giving of the law. Because Pentecost was so named because of the Greek word for 50, Pentecostia, which in Greek means 50, so named because it fell 50 days after Passover. And if you read the Exodus narrative carefully, you'll see that it's about 50 days after Passover that the people of Israel arrive at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 And there they receive the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 from God through Moses. And we have some images of Sinai present in Acts 2. We have the rush of the wind. We have the tongues of fire. If we go back to Acts 19, we see the rushing wind, the earthquake, uh, the lightning, which is the the torches or the fires from heaven in Hebrew, okay, And, and the smoke of the mountain. The difference is, though, that Sinai was the frightening storm of, of the Lord of might. But, uh, but Pentecost is the peaceful storm okay, of, of the Lord of forgiveness as we shift into the new covenant. One God, but God revealing himself uh, in a different way at Mount Zion, revealing now the depths of his mercy, which was also revealed in the Old Covenant, but was not always as apparent. So this is the peaceful storm of the Spirit in Acts 2. It corresponds to the storm at Sinai, but it's not frightening. It's inviting. And then notice all the nationalities that come and understand the gospel as uh, the the apostles begin to, uh, to, uh, to preach. Parthians, Medes, Elamites... Judeans, Cappadocians, people from Pontus and Asia, okay? This is the unbabel, okay? It's the unbabel. You probably remember a story from the Old Testament where people were gathered together at an artificial mountain that they were building, uh, and these people were confused and perplexed because all of a sudden, through a supernatural divine act they could not understand each other's languages. And so then they were scattered over the face of the earth. But here in Acts 2, we have people gathered on a natural mountain, the mountain of God, and they come together and they're amazed and perplexed because they can understand each other's languages. In fact, there's even a little bit of humor, you know, as as Luke's writing Acts 2. It's like, they were confused because they could understand. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so confusing. Like, why can I understand what's going on? <laughs> like, they're speaking and I know what they're saying, and that is like making me bewildered. 
But it's the opposite of Babel. And so the Spirit is pouring out the language of the Spirit, and through the language of the Spirit, the human family is being regathered as one. Rather than being scattered over the face of the earth as they are in in Babel, now they're being gathered to the mountain of God. And these 3,000 are gathered into the church that day. And this is in fulfillment of the prophecies of, say, Isaiah 2 uh, and elsewhere that talk about the nations gathering to the mountain of God in the final age. So we have the unbabel. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, the, uh, the soft drink 7-Up had an advertising campaign. Do you guys remember this? 7-Up, it was called the what? The Uncola, right? And, and you could send away, operators were standing by, and, and you could call, and they would send you a 7-Up cup that looked like that. Yeah, remember these? We had one. We actually called, you know, the operators, and, and they were standing by. And, um, and we, we got a 7-Up cup, you know, it was, it was like a cola cup you know, flipped upside down and you drank out of the narrow end. And so every time I get to this passage in Acts, I think, you know, the uncol the unbabel, okay? So so you know if 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 Babel is this tower, you know, then then Pentecost is is just the upside down tower, okay? So just turning everything on its head, we're reuniting, but this is the point. Babel was where the human family becomes broken up into different national divisions. Pentecost is where they're gathered together. And that's why we need a universal church that is not composed of independent national churches. Amen? When I was, I'm going to be honest, and no offense to our separated brethren, but when I was willing came to the point when I was willing to convert from Protestantism, I went through that period that many of us do where you think, okay, Catholicism or Orthodoxy, right? They both have apostolic succession. But then what did I notice about Orthodoxy? Okay, Autocephalous national churches, Bulgarian Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. You know what that does? Perpetuates Babel. But what did Pentecost come to do? Undo Babel and unite us all around the common language of the Holy Spirit. So we need a universal, we need a Catholic church that encompasses all humanity, that has real bonds of obedience and affection and loyalty that transcend national lines. And it really does change your psychology, okay? I was out in Perth, Australia last week, okay? giving talks at a parish, okay? They call Perth the end of the earth, okay? Because you look at Perth, it's on the far end of Australia. It's the most remote major city in the Western world, okay? Because it's a five-hour flight to the nearest other major cities in Australia or Singapore or something like that. So way out on the end of this remote continent, you've got this big desert separating you. You've got the outback separating you from you know, the rest of Australia, and you're just perched there on the, on the end. And I'm in this church, and they come out for, uh, for Eucharistic exposition, and, uh, and the whole congregation starts spontaneously breaking out into singing, Oh, sacrament most holy, oh, sacrament divine. All these people to look around, and everybody is from a different ethnic background. Singaporeans, Malaysians, Indonesians, people from the British Isles, uh, Germans, Dutch, um, uh, immigrants from uh, New Zealand and from from Oceania, just incredibly diverse, 250 people packed into this little church, all singing about the Blessed Sacrament. And I burst into tears. I I couldn't continue my talk, okay, because of the Catholicity. It was like Acts. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Deans, Cappadocians, Pons, Phrygia, Pamphylia, okay, gathered around the language of the Spirit. That's what the church has come to do, to gather together the, uh, the kingdom of David, to gather together the kingdom of God, to gather to one the human family. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I got to finish up on this. 
Let's talk about Peter's sermon. Peter proclaims Jesus as the son of David, the king of Israel. He says at one point in his sermon as he's preaching uh, to these people, David knew that God had sworn with an oath to set his seat upon his throne. That, folks, is the Davidic covenant, as Dr. Hahn will teach you, all right? The covenant is an extension of kinship by oath, okay? Oath swearing and covenant making, right, are intimately connected. So this sworn an oath to set his seed, that is the covenant to David. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, uh, St. Peter says about Jesus, referring to Jesus, the right hand was the place of honor and authority, And um, in ancient Israel, you took your directions from facing east. So you faced toward the rising of the sun, and north was uh, left, and uh, south was right. And if you look at the way that the temple and the palace were built in Jerusalem, they both faced east. And if you were looking east from the temple, the palace of the king was on the right. So when this king sat on his throne in the palace of Solomon, he was literally to the right of the Holy of Holies where the presence of God resided in the temple. This is an image from the Old Testament. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110 verse 1. This is a royal coronation hymn of the son of David. So what I'm saying is uh, Peter is preaching Jesus as the royal son of David at Pentecost. And look at the response of the crowd. They were cut to the heart in Acts 2.37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Wow, that is a powerful phrase. Cut to the heart, finally, okay? Moses, in ancient times, predicted 1,700 years earlier, or 1,500 years earlier, that Eventually, they would be cut to the heart. This is at the end of his last book in Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God, at a distant time, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Moses had prophesied this because in his own day, the people of Israel had an uncircumcised heart. Ezekiel echoes that with a slightly different image. He talks about removing a a heart of stone and being given a heart of flesh. Of course, a heart of stone can't be cut, but a heart of flesh can be cut. So if they're cut to the heart, it means their heart of stone has been removed, and they've been given a vulnerable heart that really can be cut, and now it is being cut. And then Jeremiah says, uh, this covenant that I'm going to give you, I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts. And in ancient times, you often wrote by making cuts into a soft clay tablet with a, a stylus, which looked like a little chisel that you would make, you would cut that into the clay. So oftentimes writing involved cutting. And so now we see the, the law of God being cut, written on the heart of the people of Israel as they hear this spirit imp- inspired preaching of Peter. It is the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy of this new covenant where the law will be on their heart. And then they say, what shall we do? You know, and, and here we get the biblical prescription of how you become a Christian, okay? You don't have to get a pamphlet, you know, the four spiritual laws or uh, some other little tract that has some way of organizing how you become a Christian. This is the passage of the New Testament that pretty much lays out how you become a Christian and how you stay a Christian in seven uh, clear steps. What does Peter say when they say in response to the crowd? He says, repent... Okay, and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that, folks, are the three actions that are all involved in baptism and confirmation. First, you need to turn away from your sin, then seek the sacrament of baptism from the church, and then as well, confirmation, which seals you with the Holy Spirit. That is how you become a Christian. And then it goes on and it it describes the life of the early church. Verse 41 says, So those who received his word were baptized. There were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. So let's put that down. They held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching. Okay? 
That is devotion to Scripture, which all of us here have. And it also refers to the liturgy of the Word in Mass. Secondly, to fellowship or communion, literally in Greek, koinonia. And that refers to sharing our lives with other Christians, which we're doing right now, and we do in many ways. But then also, specifically in Mass, it refers to the passing of the peace, which is the, uh, the, the sacred gesture by which we indicate our communion with uh, one another. And then to the breaking of bread. This is the liturgy of the Eucharist proper. This is <coughs> Eucharist communion, Eucharistic communion, as well as Eucharistic devotion, which we can express outside of Mass in, uh, for example, Eucharistic adoration. And then to the prayers, okay, which refers not only to the Eucharistic prayer and to the collect and to the other prayers of Mass, but also to our personal prayer. So these seven elements are how you become a Christian and then how you stay a Christian. And these elements refer both to our sacramental life, okay? Baptism and Eucharist encompass all these seven elements, and it also refers to our devotional life, okay? It's been 2,000 years, and these are still the seven steps of becoming and staying a Christian, and they are, by the way, the seven steps with which I end my little book, Yes, There is a God, and Other Answers to Life's Big Questions. This book goes from talking about how can we even know there is a God in the first place, why shouldn't we be atheists, and then in about 150 short pages, moves you to joining the Catholic Church. And uh, we end with uh, these seven uh, steps. Um, as a, a description of the Christian life. So I recommend this book as a, something you might read yourself and get some talking points to, to use when talking with seekers. It's also a great book to pass along to someone in your life who maybe is questioning about God or religion or investigating Christianity or something like that. It's even something you can pass out in evangelism or you could use the book as a structure for a seeker um, uh, course at your church, an inquirer's class, you know, kind of a pre-RCIA or even the early stages of RCIA because these remain the same because the church is the kingdom and we are still living in the book of Acts. Amen? amen. Let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us orphans, not left us at the mercy of different divisions and 46 different competing ideas of what the church, 46,000 different ideas of what the church should be like, but that you have maintained and upheld your universal Catholic church through the ages, founded upon the apostles to the present day, uh, their successors. Uh, keep us always faithful to your true church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.